All right, this is another one of those get your life together meetings. Uh, I do want to uh, briefly mention that we're doing this American series, American Revolution series. Um, going through a series of lectures on the American Revolutionary War. Celebrate over 200 years of our independence. Coming upon uh, 250 years of our independence in the United States of the America of the Americas uh, this is part three the die is now cast the American Patriots chose a formidable enemy Great Britain an 18th century superpower of course you might ask the question how could the British Army highly trained professional equipped with the most sophisticated weapons at the time and the technology that was known and backed by extensive financial and industrial resources, possibly lose to an enemy with none of those advantages. We might ask uh, uh, that question. Of course, the answer is that the revolutionary um, uh, history offers clues as to how at least one superpower lost a war. As political unrest increased, the Patriots first outmaneuvered loyalists and gained control of local infrastructure including militia. Britain then failed to expand loyalist support while alienating neutrals and infuriating patriots. Of course, each time the British army marched inland from a port city, the countryside swallowed them up. Lexington and Concord, Fort Stanwix and Saratoga, Fort Sackville, Kings Mountain, Cowpens, Guilford Courthouse, 96 and Yorktown all reflect the dangers inherent in moving outside an occupying army safety zone. An ocean from home, the Britain or the British found limited resources lost in battle, particularly troops, difficult to replace. International support, at first from individuals and then from governments, France, the Netherlands, and Spain, forced Great Britain into another budget busting global conflict. On the Patriot side, the Continental Army's stubborn struggle to survive was well illustrated by the leadership of General George and the winter encampments at Valley Forge and Morristown, which prolonged the war. The king and his supporters, again the king was King George III, remained intractable, refusing to diverge from an all-or-nothing strategy. The die is now cast, George III wrote in the year 1774, quote, the colonies must either submit or triumph, we must not retreat, end quote. With Patriot privateers pestering British commerce at sea, the length and expense of the land war as it dragged on eroded British public support, and the superpower blinked and then focused attention on other international threats. For Cornwallis, the results proved disastrous. He was outgeneraled by Nathaniel Green, which was Washington's most able subordinate, who now commanded the Southern Department. Green moved cautiously into South Carolina, dividing his army so that each division set on the one flank of Cornwallis at Winsboro. Green took a position on the P.D. River, while General Daniel Morgan and the South Carolina militia under Andrew Pickens advanced southwestward into the state, beginning a game of cat and mouse. Cornwallis sent uh, Tarleton's British Legion after Morgan, but on the 17th of January, 1781, Morgan decisively defeated Tarleton at Calpins. Morgan pulled back into North Carolina, where he and Green could reunite their wings and escape northward. Fleeing to Virginia, Green reorganized his force and added Virginia militia before returning to North Carolina, where he challenged Cornwallis at Guilford Courthouse in present-day Greensboro. The fighting was intense, and Green left the field to Cornwallis after inflicting more than 500 casualties while suffering only 250 of his own. It was another costly victory for Britain. Cornwallis's battered and bruised army limped to Wilmington on the coast. He had put a European military machine through stresses and strains too great to bear. Green, meanwhile, would not let up and again turned southward. In the year 1781, he fought two indecisive battles at Hobskirk's Hill, and Utah Springs and laid siege to a garrison at 96. The British commanders in the state, Lord Rawdon and Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Stewart, could not stop Green. Coordinating his moves with his local allies, Green picked off 
all the enemy held interior posts. Although large scale fighting ended in the Lower South in the year 1781, Greene's forces stood guard until the British evacuated Charleston and Savannah in the year 1782. Greene had never won a pitched battle, but he and the South Carolina partisans had fought a brilliant coalition war, a predecessor of 20th century guerrilla conflicts. Cornwallis, having abandoned the Lower South, to Green plotted up to Virginia. He rested and resupplied his bedraggled force and took under his command British raiding parties led by General William Phillips and the turncoat Benedict Arnold. After random skirmishing for two months, he retired to the coast and erected fortifications at Yorktown, perhaps believing that joint Franco-American operations against him remained unlikely. In New York, Clinton was baffled and angered by Cornwallis's wandering, but essentially continued to give him a free hand. Clinton, an insecure man, hated confrontation and failed to order Cornwallis to move to a more secure location. Although planning to attack New York City, Washington saw new possibilities when he learned that French Admiral uh, de Grasse's fleet in the West Indies was heading to the Chesapeake Bay. The 5,500 French troops under Comte de Rochambeau and the American armies under Washington hurried southward, hoping to trap Cornwallis on the Virginia Peninsula. The Yorktown Campaign of 81 had begun. At the same time, the Comte de Barras's small French naval squadron in New England waters headed down the coast for Chesapeake Bay. Simultaneously, a small American contingent that had been in Virginia all summer commanded by the Marquis de Lafayette, blocked Cornwallis's escape inland. Amazingly, in an age without instantaneous communication and rapid transportation, all land and sea forces arrived about the same time. Cornwallis's days were numbered, especially after de Grasse beat off Admiral Thomas Graves and his outmanned British naval expedition, hastily dispatched by Clinton to counter the French fleet. Outnumbered by more than a two-to-one margin and subjected to a ceaseless artillery bombardment, Cornwallis surrendered his roughly 8,000 men on the 19th of October, two months to the day from Washington's letter to de Grasse, or de Grasse, setting the gigantic undertaking in motion. Lafayette wrote that the play was over and the fifth act had just closed. And so the surrender at Yorktown provided a symbolic theater captured by John Trumbull. After first attempting to surrender to Rochambeau, a British officer then tried to surrender to Washington. Washington also refused because Cornwallis himself did not attend. Instead, General Benjamin Lincoln, field commander of the American forces, accepted the English sword. It was unclear to Washington and Congress that Britain, in fact, had lost the will to continue the American War. To continue might well have acquired the kinds of sacrifices that Britain's 18th century ruling classes were unwilling to pay. Peace negotiations had begun in Paris in the year 1782, with Benjamin Franklin and John Jay representing the United States and Richard Oswald, an old friend of Benjamin Franklin, handling matters for the British. On the 30th of November, 1782, the three diplomats approved a preliminary treaty between Britain and America to take effect when Britain and France came to terms. Hoping to win her former colonies away from the French, the London government agreed to remarkably generous terms, especially the concession of Mississippi River as the new nation's western boundary. And although in the years before the revolution, the colonists had often complained that they had been dragged into the wars of the Old World, European rivalries and conflicts between 1775 and 1783, had aided profoundly in securing American independence. Britain, with numerous enemies, fought without European allies for the first time in centuries. French military supplies and military intervention and loans from the French court and Dutch bankers were extremely critical to the American cause. Spain had entered on the side of France late in the war, but its role was minor and the Madrid court did not recognize American independence at the time. Although word of the final treaty brought great rejoicing in America, General George and Washington and numerous congressmen and other Confederation officials were sobered by internal tensions and other difficulties. 
the states, considering the war over, were increasingly unresponsive to congressional appeals for troops and financial aid. Tensions between Army officers and the lawmakers increased as well because of the military's justifiable complaints about unpaid salaries and Congress's failure to follow through on a fixed plan for post-war compensation. Discontent climaxed again in the year 1783 in the month of March at Washington's encampment at New Burr, New York. Responding to the inflammatory New Burr address circulated in the camp, Washington persuaded the officers to let him present their grievances to Congress. The army peacefully disbanded and melted into civilian life. Washington bade farewell in an emotion parting with his officers at Francis Tavern in New York City, and then he rode to Annapolis, Maryland to resign his commission before Congress. The war had transformed Washington and his senior officers into strong American nationalists. They were convinced that the new nation would not survive without a firmer kind of union than the existing Articles Confederation offered. They worked with civilian leaders of similar sentiments, like James Madison, James Wilson, and numerous others who had served in Congress or held posts in the Confederation government. They too had found the war to be a nationalizing experience. The result was the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 that created the United States Constitution, a military as well as a political document. It perpetuated the thin or the twin military traditions of the past, a professional army and a system of state militia, but greatly enlarged Congress's war and defense powers and permitted state militias to be called into federal service in times of crisis. It was to the great credit of Washington and the Continental Army that despite the stresses and the trials of the revolution, they remained committed to civil control of the military. And without that commitment, the Americans would never have agreed to such a dramatically new form of political engineering as the Constitution was. And of course, Washington, when he resigned from the army months after the Treaty of Paris, he again deferred to civilian authority in saying, quote, having now finished the work assigned me, I retire and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have so long acted, here I offer my commission, end quote. And uh, so next we will talk about um, other Americans in history, those who were forgotten in history. We'll talk about the Native Americans and uh, we'll also talk about um, African Americans as well uh, that, that contributed to the war and these forgotten Americans. Uh, it, it's a, another, we just finished our last uh, video, um, or last, yeah, last video reading from uh, Don Higginbotham, professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill. And this next one on the Forgotten Americans will be by Gary B. Nash, professor of history at the University of California, or UNC Los Angeles. Oh, you see, you see Los Angeles, and uh, and then after that, uh, we'll have our fifth lecture, "The Revolution's Legacy" by Gordon S. Wood, professor of history at Brown University, of one of the best universities for history is Brown, as well as uh, other ones like Cornell and University of Bloomington in, in Indiana. Um, and then um, that will be it. So we'll have two more series. We'll have one on the Forgotten Americans, our fourth uh, article. And then our last article will be um, about the revolution's legacy.